Well, good morning. Uh, I didn't catch all of that. I just turned around and saw a dude in half an outfit um, hitting somebody in the face. Uh, so you'll have to let me know what happened there. Uh, it looked pretty funny. Uh, Y'all doing well this morning? Good, good, good. I, I, I say this um, last, I said this last time that I was here, um, but you know, what, what the Lord is doing through Vantage Point and what the Lord has chosen to do through Pastor Mark and Chris and the team is just absolutely rare. Uh, and so please, if you by chance have not caught on that the Holy Spirit's doing a powerful work here, uh, I want to make sure, Mark can't say this about himself, but I want you to know that he is doing a powerful work through your pastor and be appreciative of him, be appreciative of him and the staff. And when they get back next week, um, why don't all, you know, all of you just go give them a big hug and say we love you and we're honored to be a part of your church family. Yep. <clears throat> Well, as you can see, uh, my, my, my assignment that was given to me is not an easy one. And probably some of you are even sitting here, you saw the video and you go, oh my gosh, God never said that. And you're a little bit surprised. And so leave it to Pastor Mark and the team to get away and then leave me with this subject matter. <laughs> but it's an important one. It's a life-changing one. So go ahead and turn to John chapter 15. We'll be reading in verse 1, probably study through about verse 8 if we have time. And uh, as you turn there, let me, let me go ahead and pray and ask the Lord's help to cover all that we must cover today. Father, Thank you for the privilege of waking up one more day and coming to rejoice and celebrate with a group of your people here in the city of Norco or Eastvale. And I thank you that, Holy Spirit, you have promised to move and to convict us through the teaching of your word. And I am thankful for what you are about to do in this room this morning. Soften hearts, remove pride, mend hearts, and allow us to walk from this room different than the way that we came in. I trust you and I thank you for doing that work because I pray it in the power and the authority of Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he takes away, Jesus said. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You're already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. But if anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away as a branch and he dries up. And they gather them and they cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. If you don't know the background here, Jesus has just left the upper room and he's walking towards the cross. He's winding through the Kidron Valley, probably by torchlight, heading to the Garden of Gethsemane. His disciples are behind him. And at some point here, it appears that he grabs one of the torches that they're carrying and he walks over and he maybe points out a, a, a group of grapes, a clump of grapes, a cluster, a vine of grapes, and he says, guys, stop. I want you to be aware of something. Throughout the next few thousand years of the church age, there's going to be groups that will be true believers and true followers of me. And, and you see these healthy vines here, these ones that are producing fruit, that's them. And said, but this, this vine also has on it some dry branches that are withering and fading away. And those represent men like Judas who just had walked out to betray him. They're pretending, but they're not real. And he says, man, I want to ask you a question. And now cross the 2,000 year time bridge right to this moment today and let that question hearken unto your soul as well. 
Are you truly a good follower and branch of Christ, or possibly are you pretending? That's the question by the time we're done today that we all must ask. Jesus leaves us no room in the middle. First, we see in the story there in verse 1 that there is a vine and a vine dresser. Look at it, verse 1. He says, I am the true vine, and my father's the vine dresser. Really quickly, the characters become quite clear, don't they? If you look at the metaphor, you look at the analogy, he says that I'm the vine. You look at picture the clump of grapes there. You got the vine that comes from the ground, and he says, and then gentlemen, those good branches will probably be you, those 11 disciples. And then Judas, he represents these withering branches. And then the father, God, is the Georgos. He's the vine dresser, the vine farmer, and his job will be to come. And the vine farmer's job was to bring his shears or his scissors and walk up and look at that group of grapes and then decide, if these branches are bearing fruit, I want to prune them and trim them back. And if these branches aren't, if they're dying off and withering, I want to cut them off and leave more room for the good branches and cast those, as we'll see here in a second, into the fire. And that's his job, the Georgos, the vine farmer's job to decide who's producing and who's not. He goes on in verse 2 and he tells us a powerful truth. He says, there are some good branches, some really good branches. Verse 2 says, every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he takes away. We'll talk about them in a second. And every branch that bears fruit... He prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. Two possible kinds. You got the ones who don't produce, and then you got the ones that do. And the way you know the ones that do produce are the ones that have fruit coming off them. Now, if you're a thinking person, and most of you are because you're at Vantage Point, obviously a very smart church, right? High intellect, IQ is over 150, everyone. The first question you ask when you study the text is what? You go, well, man, if this little piece of fruit... It's going to be the indicator of whether I'm a good branch on the vine or a bad branch on the vine, then what? I want to know what that fruit is, don't you? Don't you? Karpos, used 66 times in the New Testament, can mean everything from reward all the way to a person who's translated on into heaven to be with God and the outcome of that. There's lots of things, but there's two that we must know today. First one pops up in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Paul writes about these little things, and some of you will know what they are. They're called the fruit of the, or the fruits of the Spirit. Very good. Paul says, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desires against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. But these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. Interesting, Paul's just backing up what Jesus said. He's saying, you're either going to be in the Spirit, or you're going to be in the flesh, but you can't be in both. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now, the deeds of the flesh. Now, listen closely, because what's going to happen as we kind of move through this text today is there will be some of you who will be tempted immediately to tune me out and go, well, I think I'm saved. Go back to the video. I prayed a prayer. I was sincere at some point in my life. And so, whatever. I don't really believe this is for me. I'm going to heaven. I'm a good person. And yet, right here, Paul says, but if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law, and the deeds of the flesh are evident. And he gives us a list. Here's your list. The deeds of the flesh are evident, which are sexual immorality, impurities, sensualities, idolatry, worshiping anything other than Christ. It doesn't need to be some little God on your mantle. It can just be Netflix. When you go home tonight or today, and you have an uprooting of your soul, when you get home from work tomorrow and you have an uprooting of your soul, That little thing inside of you that says, I'm not right, I'm not feeling good, I I need something to give me hope and satisfaction tonight. If it's anything before you go to bed except Christ, that's an idol. I just got to have a drink. Just got to have some ice cream. Just got to have a little loving with the wife. Just got to turn on the television and disconnect my mind. That means you have an idol that's taking the place of God in your life. Enmities or strife, jealousies or outbursts of anger or disputes or dissensions or factions. Did all of you come to church this morning just perfectly happy with everyone else in the car? Go to apologize to her now, my brother. Sorry, dear. Envying, 
Is there anything you saw this week that you wanted and you craved that God has not currently provided? Drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I've already warned you, Paul says, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. He doesn't say that you may get there. He doesn't say that you're saved because you are sincere. He says if you're doing these things, it's evidence that you're in the flesh and not in the spirit, and you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, this is the key, the fruit, the outworking. Remember Jesus said you'll know them by their fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and kindness and faithfulness and self-control. Isn't that interesting? He says the outworking of this thing called this, this fruit that comes out of a person who's a believer, this outward indication of an inward transformation that only the Holy Spirit can do is going to be love, showcase through joy, peace, patience, on and on and on. Now, here's the point. You can't make that happen, and I can't make that happen. You've tried, and I've tried before. Have you ever woke up in the morning and thought, okay, today I'm going to have the fruits of the Spirit? And how long did it last? About a day or an hour? Why don't I have the fruits of the... You can't manufacture this. This can only come from Christ. It can only come from the Holy Spirit. Meaning that it's an indicator of whether you're truly a good branch or not. If you do not have love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control, then it's very likely that you are not a believer in Christ. It doesn't matter how sincere you were when you raised your hand, when you walked the aisle, when you prayed the prayer. It doesn't matter. If you're not seeing the Holy Spirit doing the work that he promised to do in you, that's an indicator that you're not saved at all. Now, that's an absolutely frightening truth because a lot of us weren't taught that from the age that we were four. The great Jonathan Edwards, theologian 300 years ago, said clearly, all the fruits of the Spirit which lay weight upon us as evidence of grace are summed up in charity or Christian love. And the only way, therefore, in which any can know their good estate is by discerning the exercises of this divine charity in the heart. For without charity, let men have what gifts they please, but they still are nothing. He goes on to say, show me your power, show me your influence, show me how wonderful you are, but if you don't have love, you are still nothing. The first fruit that comes on these vines, or these branches out of Christ, is the fruits of the Spirit. That's how you know. There's another one, Matthew 13. Y'all remember the parable of the soils? Jesus is, says there's, there's a sower, and he's a farmer, and he's walking along, and what does he do? He takes the seed out of his little pouch, and he throws some over here, and it lands on the, barren, uh, the side of the road, and the birds come, and they pick it away right away, and then he pulls out a little more seed, and he throws it on another part, and that's the rocky soil, and then it comes out of the ground, but then the sun comes and scorches it, and he pulls out a little more, and he throws it over here, and what happens over there is it starts to grow up, and it looks good. It's bearing crops and fruit, but then suddenly the thorns come up, and they begin prickling it away, and he says, but then there's this one last group of seed that's scattered on the good ground and it produces crop, 160 and 30 fold. And then he interprets for us in Matthew 13, 18, what this parable means. He says, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the evil one comes and he snatches away what's been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom seed was sown over there beside the road. And so a lot of you have friends like that. They're not here today. They don't want to be around you. They don't want to be around church. You invited them to church. Do you remember that? Hey, so... Uh, and you're kind of nervous when you were doing it. So there was this thing. It's called like VP, yo. It's called Vantage Point. And I just want you to come. And, um, and they were doing this Easter service. And Pastor Mark, you know, and I love you more than anybody. And I want you to come. And they just looked at you. And then they very graciously let you know they have no desire to be here with you today. Those are people in the kingdom of God has confronted them. And they've just said, no, I want nothing to do with it. Satan immediately takes it from them. And they, nothing to do. That's a group of people, but you're not here today. Now let's talk about plausibly the group of people. And some of you may be here today. Jesus goes on and he says in verse 20, the one on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root inside, but it's temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of that word, immediately he falls away. This is the group that has the big Bible. You went and bought the big Bible. It's the study Bible. And you had a big grin on your face, and you walked into church, and you sat in the front row, right, right down here with the spiritual crowd, right? <laughs> whoop, 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 whoop. I didn't know you were going to do that. I, I, 
I'm... But then all of a sudden at work, someone made fun of you because you were reading your Bible, and then those people start saying to themselves, this is a little too embarrassing, a little too shameful, I just don't want any more of it, and then they're gone. There's another one, verse 22. And the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word. And the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Check that one out, Southern California, 2016. I'll take some of that Jesus guy as long as I can add him like a cherry on top of the Sunday of my life. But the moment that he starts taking away or has a cost that's too much and requires much of me to go to Slovenia or wherever that is, then all of a sudden I'm out and the world begins to choke people and takes away what was inside. Money and entertainment Having a spouse, having a person in my life is more important than Christ. And that stuff chokes you out. If you're here this morning and you are on a rotation coming to church, I dare say this may be you. You come to church once or twice a month and you rotate because you have vacations and you got places you like to get to, you like your travel plans, and you got excuse after excuse after excuse. Listen, the thorns are coming for you and they may tear you away. Where else would you rather be than in the house of God with the people of God? Where and why? And ask yourself why? And finally, verse 23. The one on whom seed was sown on the good soil, this is the man who hears the word and understands it. And please, friends, if you have your Bible, if you don't, if you got a phone, look at this, highlight it, circle it. These are words we miss all the time when we read Christ's word. Look what he says. He says, who hears the word and understands the word, who indeed will bear fruit and bring forth some 100, some 60, and some 30. Do you see that? He says, indeed, he doesn't say you may bear more fruit and you might bear more fruit. He says, you will bear more fruit. You see, the second outworking of a true Christian is that they're attached to the vine and their love for Christ and for others comes out of them and then they start seeing other people in their life love Christ and love others too. They're evangelists by their very nature. Let me ask you today, I'll just, I'll just tell you about Asia. The fastest growing church in the world is in Asia. Do you know how you become a member of a church in Asia? The way you become a member of a church in Asia is not to sign on the dotted line and it's not to go to a class. Once they, one of the person of the church has ardently prayed for the salvation of another and then been a participant in seeing them come to faith, then they are included as a member of the church. Until they've borne fruit, they are not considered a member of the church because they have no clear indicator that they actually are saved. Now let me provide that litmus test upon us today. How many of us can say that one day when we get to the courts and we're standing before the throne room of Christ, we're going to be able to say, right behind me here, right over here next to me, is a brother or a sister who's here today because you chose to use me, great God, to get them here to heaven. You chose me as the vessel unto your glory and honor. How many people will be in heaven because of your life? Jesus goes on, and he says, in every branch, John 15, 2, that bears fruit, these good branches, these ones that are producing love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and faithfulness, goodness, self-control, and these ones that are actually bearing and breeding more f- further converts under my name, he says that they will be pruned. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. He tells these men, you're already clean, you're already catharo because the Holy Spirit's come in and regenerating you and you'll believe what I have to say. Isn't it interesting there? He says that if you're a good branch, because everyone here wants to be a good branch. He goes, yeah, I want to be a good branch. I want to be in the vine, I want to be in Christ. But then he says, but if you're going to be a good branch, there's going to be this thing called pruning that you're going to go through. And immediately we go, oh, that doesn't sound good, does it? I don't want to be pruned. Prune sounds like he's going to take those scissors and start cutting some things away from me. 
Does the Bible support that? You bet it does. Listen to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And he scourges every son whom he receives. It's for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. If you don't have discipline, if you don't have scourging, you don't got trial from God, then you're not one of his children. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. You remember the spankings you got when you were a kid? Remember the timeouts you got? Some of you 22-year-olds are like, my papa's still doing that. You got to move out. Verse 9, furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them for it. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share his holiness. Isn't that interesting? He disciplines us so we will be set apart like him. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who've been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit, there's your word again, the fruit of righteousness. Some of you are saying, why? Why does it always seem to be me? Life is hard. Now look at my unbelieving friends, and they're cruising in their seven series, and they got the pretty wife and the nice kids, and they're all going off to Stanford. What, God? What is wrong with me? Some of you right now, this morning, are under the burden, the, the pressure of God, and you're going, why? Why, oh, Lord, why? Because he loves you. Because he wants what's best for you. You remember in Romans 9 when he says, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. Remember Esau is kind of just floating through life. Jacob's under the thumb of God, the pressure of God. But Jacob's the one that's in heaven with him today. Which one would you rather be? Ben Carson, you know him? Ran for president, devout Christian man. Our, our, our country won't elect men like that anymore. No way. Presidency is simply a reflection of who we are and I'll let it stand at that. It's true. We put people in the White House that appease and exemplify the majority of who we are. We vote them in there. No way Ben Carson would have made a devout Christian. He was head of neurological pediatrics for John Hopkins by the age of 33. Brilliant mind. Loves God. Patient man. Took, he actually took a part, I guess you could call it, Two conjoined twins who were, you know, conjoined in the, in the brain and was world famous for it. The first guy ever to do it. Do you know back when he was eight years old, that guy was going through a tremendous amount of hardship as a young kid. No father. I think Boston or Detroit, wherever it was. He's going to flunk out of school. He's getting involved in gangs. His mama walks home. And oh boy, mama had it going on. She walked home, she saw him sitting there in front of the television, heard he was flunking out of school and getting into trouble. She stood in front of that TV, turned it off. She said, young man, he didn't even know, she couldn't read. He said, young man, you go down to the library. You're going to get two books a week, you're going to come home, and you're going to write reports on them. And until I see two reports on two library books every week, you're not watching one show. And you only get to watch one show on Saturdays, even if you do them. Now, every single mom and dad, I don't care what your style of parenting is, goes, that's cool, man. I like that. I love when a parent reproves, and I love when a parent has consequences. I love when a parent loves their child enough to do things that will be unto their good and to their best. In fact, I want my son or daughter to run for president someday, and you go home and you do that for them. We love that. Why in the world, then, do we not like it when God the Father does it to us? Why would we say that is a good earthly parent, and yet when the Father does it, we say, how could you? Oh, Lord, do not be frustrated and do not be frightened if you're being disciplined by God. Be frightened if you are not. If you're floating willy-nilly through this life right now, rocking and rolling and everything's clicking for you and you never find yourself brought low, be deeply concerned. Verse 4, Jesus says, these good branches abide in me and I in you. 
The word meno means, he says, it's an imperative phrase. He says, you stay close and I'll stay close. I, I promise. You abide in me. You're around me. You're, you're with me. You're under me. You're, you're in communion with me every day. He says, you just come and you, and you search me. You seek me. You follow me. You go to bed at night and you trust me with your life. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. He says, if you want to do anything of worth, anything of value, anything of good, you must be in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. And then check this out. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing means a barren wasteland. That's what the word means. It's an inconsequential ending. What he's doing is he's saying these good branches, these ones who abide in me every day, are going to stand before the Bema seat one day and the throne room of God. And Isaiah and Jeremiah and Paul will be over there and they'll be looking down and they'll be watching along with all the other people in the bleachers, millions and millions of Christians from, from present, past, and future. And then it'll be your turn or my turn to walk there before the Bema seat and we will stand there, friends. And Jesus will look at us and all of our front and our mask will be completely ripped away and we'll be naked and ashamed or unashamed before him with all of our works being shown. And he says, there will be people there who will be a barren wasteland. Their life will amount to nothing. But you, if you are a good branch who abided in me and produced fruit, you will stand there and it will be proven that you had works of gold and they will remain and they will be rewarded. You will not stand there a barren wasteland in the final day. There are good branches who bear great fruit. But then sadly, the last part of this illustration, there are also rotten branches. Look at it there in verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and he dries up. And they gather them and they cast them into the fire and they are burned. While these good branches who are abiding in Christ are undergoing pruning by the Father so that they would pr produce more fruit, he says, there's another group. And they're withering away. And eventually, the Georgos, the vine farmer, will come up and he will take his shears and he will cut them off for good and they will be sent to the fire. In Christ, you will be growing. Without Christ, you will be going, but there is no middle ground. James actually said, let the wealthy in America 2016, listen to me, you are wealthy. Everyone here is wealthy. You had a choice to get in your car this morning. You had a choice to eat. You have a choice to go home into a house of some kind. You are wealthy. Many have not had those things. James says, let that man, the wealthy man, come and be humbled by any kind of harsh circumstances because that is the kind of thing that will save him from the plight of the thorns that want to choke out his faith. The wealthy are nothing but a, a withering flower. They are fading away. 2016 American church, vantage point, I'm talking to you as directly as I can. I can't see all of you because of the bright light in my face. I'm trying to see your eyes. Jesus says that the true bride of Christ, there will be a true bride, and she will come into church, and she will love him, and she will worship him. And then he says, but there will be a group who comes and follows after him, but they are nothing but pretenders. That means even here today, right now. There are some of you, and you can think of nowhere you'd rather be than right here, right now. You rushed into worship today. You, you flocked into worship today. You sang at the top of your lungs. You can think of nowhere you'd rather be than here with your friends and your family, fellowshipping and worshiping and, and opening up the word of God. You can think of nowhere you'd rather be. And tonight when you get home before you go to bed, you will think of nowhere you'd rather be than on your knees praying and crying out to your Savior, thanking him for all that he's done and following him as your Lord. You can think of nowhere that you'd rather be. 
Because you're the part of the bride of Christ. You're being set apart. You're being pruned back for his good. But there's also another group here today. You're here because your spouse made you come. You're here because you thought it might be a place to find a good-looking spouse or a hookup. Some of you are here because you're a demonic distraction. You know this is the place that God is working in, so you come to be a distraction. You don't even know why you're here. Friends, I've seen it a hundred times. Listen, the mighty vine farmer will come, and he will cleanse his bride by removing you. The Bible tells us all the ways he does it. It could be illness. It could be death. But he will protect his bride. It may be that you're sent back out off to the world from which you came. It may be that you're sent off to some lukewarm church in the area that preaches non-gospel truth. And you'll sit up in the bleacher seats and you'll sit there with all your unregenerate friends cheering some supposed Jesus on your way to hell. But Christ will cleanse his true bride. He promises to. Jesus says, guys, there's going to be some who really follow me, but there's going to be others who don't. They pretend, but they don't really abide in me. And then in verse 7, he says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. He's kind of given us the answer, the solution, because if you're like me, when you study these, tag, these texts, you go, okay, Christ, please, please tell me, how can I be sure that my faith is real, my belief is solid, that everything that I'm doing here has the evidence of the Holy Spirit's work upon it? And Jesus tells us there in verse 7, he says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. He knows to simply instruct abide but not tell us how to do it would be malicious, and so he connects the rhema, the word. And he says, when you're abiding in me, my word will be in you. That's the Bible that you hold in your hands prayerfully this morning. That will be in you. How do you abide in someone? How do you listen? How are you in communion with them? I'll, I'll tell you. You sit under them. You have relationship with them. Pick your favorite person in the world. Who's your favorite superhero or hero real person, not the Avengers, but everyone from, from, from era past? Is it Einstein? Is it Abraham Lincoln? Picture who that person is. Maybe it's LeBron James. I, I don't know. Well, Steph Curry. Who is it? If right now you had the opportunity today to get one hour with them, what would you do in their presence? I guarantee you wouldn't be telling them how cool you are. You wouldn't be telling them what you learn. You take your hero. You sit in their presence, and what you do is you sit and you listen. You would listen to them. How come millions of Americans are calling Christ their Lord, but they will not listen to him? They won't open their words. You, we won't listen to them. You can't say that Jesus is your Lord, the favorite best thing in all of human history and eternity, and then ignore him, and when you get into his presence, ask for the things you want and talk about yourself? And never open your word and never listen to him. That is not abiding in Christ. You want to have a good marriage? He's got a lot to say about good marriages. So open up his word and listen to him. You want to have your kids raised to follow Christ and you want them to be good men and women who are going to do great things across the world? Then open up his word. He's got a lot to say to you about your children. How many hours a week do we spend at our jobs? You know, he's got a lot to say about your job, too, and how you work. Have you listened to him and asked him about it? See, to not listen to him and only listen to me, he says, I don't abide in him, I abide in me. So you're abiding in yourself if you're doing that. And there is no way yourself is going to get you through this damnable, treacherous world that's ahead. There's no way you're going to get from being an unholy person to a holy God by your unholy actions and your unholy abiding and your unholy self. You must have Christ. Your way to salvation. Your avenue unto hope. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, then what happens? Look at it in verse 7. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Did you catch that? If you're abiding in Christ, 
and his words abiding in you, your desires become his desires. And therefore, anything you desire, he's going to do because it ultimately is for his glory. And it's what he desires. The, the way that you can have your prayer answered, the key to getting what you want is wanting what he wants. If you're floating through life and you're not seeing prayer answered and you're not seeing any, you know, him show up, as they say. By, by the way, one of the, the most silly things I've ever heard is this thing called prayer backing. You hear people like pray for people and they go, we've got to give them prayer backing. As if somehow God gets behind a person and then they march out and he's got their back. Listen, God is the front. He is the back. He is all around. He is everywhere in between. The only way we move anywhere is through him. He is prayer everything, not prayer backing. And so what happens is, is you desire what he wants and you want what he wants and you're in his word and you know that, you get on your knees and you begin begging him, going, God, I want what you want. That's the idea of praying in his name. The anoma, the purposes, the authority of God. When you pray in the authorities of Christ's name and you want what he wants, then he promises to answer. Friends, if you're not seeing answered prayer in your life, if you're not seeing him show up and do mighty things in your life according to your understanding of the word of God, then be deeply concerned and ask yourself, why in the world would the mighty God, the king of the universe, who promised through his son to answer prayers, not answer yours? It's not his problem. It's ours. James actually tells us, he says, you ask and don't receive because you ask with wrong motives. So that you may spend it on your pleasures. He goes on after that to say, you're an adulteress. You can't be a friend of God and a friend of the world. God's not answering your prayers because they aren't real prayers. It's just you being self-focused and trying to get ahead in the game for yourself. He says, I don't answer those prayers. My son Ethan is about nine. If he came to me today or on Friday and he said, Daddy, I uh, would like $20. I say, why, son? Why do you need $20? Well, Daddy, because it's Friday and we've got our, our family night tonight. And so I want to go out and buy 20 of those big monster drinks, you know, the, the ones that, that, that the, with all the caffeine in them. And so I just wanted to be really pumped and really amped for family night tonight when we play games. And so, Daddy, can I have 20 bucks? I'm going to refuse him. But if my son comes to me and he says, Daddy, can I have 20 bucks? I say, son, why do you want $20? He says, well, you know, because the compassion child that we sponsor, Peter or Marion or, or, or Justin in Ecuador, you know, they need a, a stocking cap because it's his birthday and I want to send him one. What am I going to say to him? I'm going to say to him, take $100. Buy him five. Because amounts are not the issue. Motives are the issue. Amounts aren't an issue for your king. Motives are the issue. It is not that God is not answering your prayer. It's that you are yet to pray a real prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, do you know it? Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our Father who art in heaven, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? We know that part of the prayer. What's the part after that? Give us this day our daily bread. Which part are we focusing on, the daily bread or the front half? Because if we're wholly focused on the front half and we're saying, oh my goodness, God, all I want is your kingdom to come and your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. I want that to see in my storyline, the divine act of Christ Jesus working through the fruits of the Spirit in my life. And oh, about the daily bread part, I trust that will work its way out. If you want me to have bread because it brings glory to your name, then that's great. But if you don't want me to have anything and you want me to starve and that brings glory to your name, that's fine too. All I want is the first part of the prayer and then he promises to answer that and the rest will work itself out. How are you praying? How are you praying? Friend, how are you praying? Are you praying? Jesus closes and says, My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and here it is, brothers and sisters. Please grab your pen and circle this. Highlight it on your phone. Take it home and weep over it if you must. My Father's glorified by this, that you bear much fruit. Read it with me. And so you what? And you prove to be my disciples. 
He says all of this, the good fruit coming off of the good branches, the prayers that are answered as you know my word are going to prove that you are actually one of my disciples and it will bring God glory. There is way too much teaching right now in American pulpits that's about me, 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 me. Me-centered preaching, me-centered books. You go to Lifeway and the whole front of the bookstore is about me. I am this, my purpose this, and on and on and on and on. Jesus just gave you your reason for life. It's to glorify the Father. That's what we do. You want to put something on your mantle. You want all your kids to follow and leave the house after 18 years and have one thing in their heart, make it that. My Father is glorified in this. You know, there's only one person across the scriptures who preaches a me-centered gospel, and his name is Lucifer. Jesus says, if you are good fruit, you will abide in me. You will know my word. You will pray prayers that are my prayers that are answered, and you will bring glory to my Father. Brothers and sisters, it's this simple this morning. That torchlight that we talked about at the beginning that was over there looking at the grapes is now shining. Jesus is standing here. He's holding it out. It's just you and him. You see that glazing gleam coming off of his face there on the Kidron Valley before the Garden of Gethsemane where he's about to be damned on behalf of all humanity and for your sins, and he stares at you today, and he holds out that torch, and he looks at you, and says, are you one of my branches or will you wither and be cast to the fire? Answer him. Answer him with your mind. Answer him with your tongue. And please, friends, answer him with your life. Heavenly Father, as we close this morning, we are reminded That right before you went to the cross, you looked at your men and you explained to them that following you would cost everything. That it is the totality of our human being. It is the totality of our commitment. And I ask this morning that, Holy Spirit, you would fall so heavy upon my brothers and sisters here that they would commit the totality of their life to you. That leaving this place with your regenerative work inside of their heart, they would walk out to love and to joy and to peace and to patience and to kindness and to goodness and to faithfulness and self-control. That they would walk out the doors these days as men and women who are on fire to share your word. That their very life and their testimony in their jobs, their very testimony at home, the testimony even when they're having fun in the parks, when they're walking through the city, would be a testimony of praise to your name. That when these men and women come into contact with, when others come into contact with this group here, they immediately say, what is the joy that you found? And with boldness and with clarity, they say, I have found Christ. And through this, O Father, you promise to bring glory to the name of Christ Jesus, who died upon Calvary's tree for us. Bear fruit, O God. Bear fruit in this place, O God. Bear fruit in this city, O God. Through Vantage Point Church, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.